Welcome to Box Office bob Bombs. If a movie is based on a video game, chances are it's going to blow. Uh, across the aisle for me today is a man whose takes are colder than the fearsome grip of the deadly Sub-Zero himself, Dylan Flynn. Hey, you may have heard of a fatality, a brutality, a babality, perhaps even an animality. But when it comes to my co-host, the only way to finish him is with homosexuality. I'm talking, of course, about Mr. Trevor Ickrath. Dylan, so great to be back. And we're kind of we're kind of breaking from the classic uh, two guys format that has been so appropriate for discussing these movies today. A player three, to me, always a little bit of an awkward, at least in the in the multiplayer arcade cabinet thing, always a little awkward. Four is great. Two is great. One is fine. Three is a little weird, right? Three is a crowd, as they say. Then you got to start reaching for the characters that nobody really wants to be, like your Donatello's and stuff That's like that. That's true. I should introduce him, though, because we are honored to have our very first guest this week. You uh, know him. You love him. He's a writer and director whose independent films have screened in festivals around the globe. And as a podcaster, he has made quite a little stir uh, kind of doing for the angry video game nerd what Joe Rogan did to living in California. Please give a big box office bob welcome to Frankie Frame. The easiest get on the internet. <laughs> I thought you were going to say what Joe Rogan did for Carlos Mencia. You know, the, oh, yeah. uh, but that makes no sense because there's no like ongoing love for Carlos Mencia. You know, he didn't save anybody's lives. But I feel like the my analogy makes sense because you don't always talk about the angry video game nerd, but when you do, it makes quite a stir. But when I do, I fucking mean it. <laughs> and I assume Joe Joe Rogan talks about other things besides moving out of California. But yeah, well, m- much like him, I, I talk about like that main thing and weed. <laughs> <laughs> Joe's just pro it, and I'm very like pur- puritan about the whole thing. And interdimensional demons, I think, come up sometimes. They will today, right? In this uh, episode, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's right. We're going to be going to Outer Worlds. Your soul is mine. Oh, Jesus. We're already getting to the quotes. We better get into the fucking trivia. We are talking today about 1995's Mortal Kombat. Sub-Zero throws an ice boomerang that slices through the victim's abdomen. Sub-Zero spin kicks their upper body to face backwards. The ice slams into their head and their torso slides to the ground. Mortal Kombat. Rated PG-13. That's right. A great follow-up to our last movie, Street Fighter. Kind of always been the two, you know, yin and yang of the fighting game scene for me. I would say even the 90s, like, yin and yang of coin-op arcade. Sure. Growing up, were you were you guys more of a Street Fighter kid or a Mortal Kombat kid? Mortal Kombat. All the way. I was a bad at fighting games kid, you know? Yeah, we just, we discussed earlier that, like, neither of us were very good at it. But if I had to pick, uh, Street Fighter was definitely it. Because if there's one thing my mother and I ever agreed on, it's that the Mortal Kombat games were way too violent for me. Well, it, it, it's, it's kind of like asking, were you a Genesis or a Super Nintendo kid? It's kind of the same question. That's true. It is, a little bit. That's to true. a lesser extent. I was not allowed to touch Mortal Kombat. My parents like paid very little attention to popular culture, but if they heard that something was no good, then I wouldn't be allowed to do it. And Mortal Kombat fell into that. But then I just remember that there were these kids in my grade who like their parents didn't give a shit what they did. And so they were always talking, they were talking, ripping out spines. And I was always just thinking like, man, their parents are so cool. But then like looking back, I think all those kids had real issues and pretty yeah, real abuse of childhoods, <laughs> pretty negligent parents, actually. Mm-hmm. I don't remember how I got into the games, but I was deep into the games. And the, and the weird part is I wasn't all that scandalized or seduced by the violence, even though that was the main selling point. Somehow, some way, and maybe the movie had a lot to do with it, I got kind of sucked into the lore. The world building. Yeah, they got me with their story. The the Lin Kuei and the you know the Thunder God and this decade, you know, every decade there's a war between the outer world and the I don't know, the inner world <laughs> and, or out world and in world. Yeah, even as a kid who was a little too afraid to engage with Mortal Kombat, I could I could feel like there was a dense like lore there that I was attracted to as the kind of kid who was also very into like Power Rangers. So yeah. Exactly. It does seem like I associate anyway Mortal Kombat as being an older brother franchise. It's a good way to put it. Let's talk about uh, some some stats though. This movie it came out in August eighteenth, nineteen ninety five. Released by New Line Cinemas, based of course on the 
Midway arcade title. The first Mortal Kombat game came out in 92. So pretty quick turnaround if you think about it. Mortal Kombat 92, the movie by 95, it really set the world on fire. God, this initial run like of early video game adaptations where it was just one year after another. Like You had to imagine like if you were like a video game nerd back in the day, you were like a pig and shit. You would think that the returns were, it was must have been a gold mine, but it's it's always tenuous. Although this time, though, you, you got a $20 million budget, which I think is very responsible, and it earned 122 mil internationally. That's pre-rental, pre-home market. Um, you know, if we take that rule of thumb, two and a half times the budget, 50 million would have been break even. So you got a good almost a hundred million dollars of profit coming off this thing. Yeah, and this also was like the widest release for a video game movie so far. It opened on uh 2,421 screens. Did you were you able to see this in theater, Frankie, or, or is that was that a no-go? Oh well, you make a good point about it being a big brother movie. Cause I, my first thought was, well, I didn't have one of those. So how did that how did I get to see this movie? No, it was there I had friends who were, I uh, I had two friends that were twins and they had an older brother (laughs) and I went to their house and we, we did like a big movie night where they had all seen it. They had all, uh, and I remember they dubbed it onto VHS for me so that I could take it home. Cool. It was very helpful that it was PG-13. Um, that went a long way in, in terms of like getting parents to kind of like leave us alone about it. Dubbing to send home from a movie night with your friends. Like that's awesome. That's like an Oscar gift bag. Yeah. A dubbed copy of Mortal Kombat on VHS has got to be like one of the ideal ways to watch it in this day and age. I imagine. Totally. I agree. And we loved it. We loved We loved the movie. Like we, I, I remember having like an excellent time. We found it infinitely quotable. Uh, the characters were, I mean, the jokes were funny. It was, it was kind of, you know, there's, there was an era, I'm sure it's true today as well, where you had like mature content technically because there's violence and there's whatever, there's some sexuality, but in reality, it's, it's actually aimed for ad- adolescents and younger. Like, you know, I think of like, um, uh, a movie like Billy Madison, you know, where it's like, this isn't actually for adults, right? Like, this is for children. Starring none other than uh, Bridget Wilson. Yeah, 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 exactly. From this movie. Yeah, I kind of felt, I was bracing for a very sanitized Mortal Kombat experience, but I think for 1995, they pushed that PG-13 respectably far. Yeah, they figured it out. I thought they found some, like, interesting workarounds, too, because I was reading that, um, like, the PG-13 rating only prohibited them from showing, like, human death. So there's a couple instances where, like, some human characters turn into not really human forms and then have, like, a gorier death than you imagine what would have otherwise been allowed. In in the 90s, there was quite a bit of that sort of thing. Like, the two examples that leap to mind are in Power Rangers, um, you could take, like, you know, the sharp side of a sword and slash into a monster, and as long as, like, sparks flew out... (laughs) Um, you know, the, you, <laughs> the violence was totally accepted. Yeah. And the same thing was true of, uh, in, in the Ninja Turtles cartoon, they just had to turn the foot soldiers into robots. And then it's like, oh, fuck them up. Um, <laughs> go crazy on those fuckers. Uh, we can, as the more we dehumanize the victim, <laughs> the less we care about the atrocities. <laughs> Right. Yeah, well, if they're quite literally not a human, right? <laughs> That's helpful. So maybe if you're a frozen, if you're an ice cube human, it's okay to, like, show your viscera. Right, or say if Scorpion rips off his face and turns into a skeleton man, you can, like, cut him up a bit and set him on fire and blow him up, you know? <laughs> this is working smarter, not harder. Or yeah. maybe it's both, hard and smart. I mean, that's really, I feel like, the result of having a skilled visionary director on hand. Do you want to talk about who directed this movie? Paul Thomas Anderson. Yep. Right. Easily confused with the actual director of this film, Paul W.S. Anderson. If this was his first major studio production, uh, he's going to become a real figure on this show because he's kind of, he's turned into one of the real yeah. icons of video game adaptation cinema. Kind of the patron saint of the genre. Right. We're going to be jumping around in this format so goddamn much that let's ground ourselves with like a very brief, very economical synopsis of what happens in the movie Mortal Kombat. For nine years in a row... Shang Tsung and his stable of dark warriors have won the Mortal Kombat tournament. If they win it a tenth time, Earthrealm will be invaded and conquered by the evil emperor of Outworld. The fate of our planet now rests in the hands of three bickering would-be heroes and their weirdo mentor, Lord Raiden. (laughs) I have questions about the rules of this, of the Mortal Kombat deal. You can invade 
a realm if you win 10 annual tournaments. Now, if Earth wins, does it roll over? Is it nothing to nothing? Or do you still have nine wins and just have to win again next year to get it? You're asking about it like it's health benefits. Like, do you know, do I <laughs> do my hours roll over? I feel like they said it was specifically in a row. And that feels like a rule specifically made by like somebody who is about to go, we'll never, we'll never lose 10 years in a row and then lose this like nine years in a row. Let's go through our roster here. It's not quite as unwieldy uh, as Street Fighter last week. So I think we'll get through this a little bit p- more painlessly than we did last week. All right, we've got we've got good guys and we've got bad guys. And leading up the good guys, we've got Liu Kang, an ex and monk who wants revenge for his brother's death. He's played by Robin Shao. I think one of the real weaknesses of the Mortal Kombat IP for me, for my interest and like my investment in it, is I always forget that this guy is kind of the main character of Mortal Kombat, but he's so unmemorable to me. Like Mortal Kombat's a really interesting franchise because I feel like in general, it's got some really interesting, like memorable characters, but the lead main guys are really bland and like kind of nothing. Did you guys see the 2019 movie? No. no. We'll see it when we get there. Yeah, weeks and weeks away. Well, you know, I, I don't want to spoil anything, but I'll, I'll tell you this. It's obvious to me that the filmmakers agree with you <laughs> and they 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 they're like you know what we need a protagonist that will actually work and so they they kind of invent a new protagonist that's not in the games and then all of the characters are kind of like ancillary mm. uh, auxiliary characters i don't know if that's the answer i think you got to get sonya in there or johnny in there and ah well there there's a wb animated version of the same basic story it's like mortal kombat one kind of okay and it came out just a few years ago. It's I think it's called like Scorpion's Revenge or something. They decided to sh- to to center Scorpion because he's got his whole thing, and they don't do anything with that in this movie. No, um, he's he's kind of like like a zombie of Shang Tsung's in this movie. So that they you know, I, I, like in a in a roster of even seven or eight heroes, like somebody's got to go, you know. Yeah. But in the in the animated one, they decided to kind of like like. Uh, put him at the center of the whole thing. And it kind of works narratively. That makes sense. Yeah. But also, bear in mind, Frankie's talking about a WB animated series. So if you want to watch that, probably get around to that sooner than later. Because within the next year, it might just be completely deleted from all services. Oh, yeah. Zaslav takes a big dump on it. (laughs) (laughs) For no reason. For taxes. That one's getting sent to Outworld. Uh, Let's get through these main three, at least. Johnny Cage, an egotistical Hollywood star out to prove that he can really fight, played by uh, Lyndon Ashby. I think it's so funny and so quaint that his setup is that the press is hounding him because they don't believe he can really do kung fu and that he's faking it in his movies. (laughs) I really enjoyed this Lyndon Ashby performance, though. Um, I, I read that uh, Anderson actually like encouraged a lot of the actors to ad lib a lot of their dialogue on set, and I think he really comes through with some good jokes and some one liners. You liked those Johnny Cage quips, did you? I thought they were great. Like when um when what's his name Liu Kang throws his bags over the side of the boat, and he's like, "At least I didn't ask him to park my car." They're all that. Those are five hundred dollars sunglasses, asshole. I just, yeah. I, I had had enough of it by the end, to be honest. All right. Well, don't don't you think it's a, a pretty good shtick to have one character who doesn't realize that this is a, a murder tournament? <laughs> that that is like one of my favorite aspects of of the Mortal Kombat story is a guy who more or less thinks he's showing up to an audition. <laughs> yeah, truly out of his depth. <laughs> I'll, t- I'll tell you this. Wait, wait, as a child. Johnny Cage was by far the most memorable. We that was the thing that we were quoting. Yeah, you're right. It's cheesy, but like for for us seven year olds, it was it was where it was at. Maybe for a certain kind of seven year old, Sonya Blade would have been where it's at. A hard ass special forces officer looking for the man who killed her partner, played by Bridget Wilson, as from the aforementioned Billy Madison, played Veronica Vaughn. Do we remember the little song that Adam Sandler sings about her in that? So hot. <laughs> Want, Want to, to touch, touch the high baby? <laughs> yeah, that's what I kept singing the whole time. Ow! <laughs> I do want to touch the hiney. He's not wrong. Next, we've got one of one of my favorite performances in the movie. One of my favorite characters, Lord Raiden, God of Thunder and Protector of Earthrealm, played by Christopher Lambert, uh, Connor McLeod in the Highlander series. Can't miss him in this one, right? That wig, the <laughs> that fucking voice. Yeah, I mean, a lot of like the stuff like. I saw in this movie kind of passed the sniff test, like to me as like somebody who isn't super familiar with like Mortal Kombat lore. But this I knew was kind of like this portrayal of Raiden I knew was definitely 
not what he looks like in the games. And I imagine not what he sounds like either. Way off model. Way off model. Do you think they thought that they couldn't do two, two Chinese actors? Do you think they were afraid to do that? But I mean, they kind of do, right? Because you got Shang Tsung and you got uh, Liu Kang already. Do you think they thought they were at, cri- at critical mass? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that was the rule. Yeah, two is, two is max mm-hmm. in 1995. Uh, if there was one character who really grabbed me by the heart and turned me into a super fan, it had to have been our final good guy here on the roster, Art Lean. A guy who is uh, really set up as the emotional core of the movie, uh, played by Kenneth Edwards, as just a guy who's also in the contest. He has like one scene talking to Johnny Cage where he's like, hey, you're Johnny Cage. I'm Art Lean. (laughs) And then later, uh, Goro kills him as kind of a, I see what the screenwriter's doing here. You need to kill a good guy to show the stakes. You're not allowed to kill any of your main three. So they add this guy. But that fucking moment when when Goro kills him and then in slow motion, Sonya just lets out this like fierce death cry of a no! It's just so silly. Like, I don't think they'd shared a a second of screen time up until that moment. And basically family. Uh, That's it. That's all our good guys. Everybody else in here is a heavy. Let's talk about our bad guys. We got um, uh, Shang Tsung, a demon sorcerer who steals the souls of his vanquished enemies, played by Kari Hiroyuki Sagawa. I remember him as looking more like Fu Manchu, like an old dude with a big beard. In the game, I mean, rather. If the, yeah, it would have been kind of silly if the final fight in the movie was, you know, hot-looking Liu Kang against, uh, <laughs> you know, an elderly man. Really hot-looking, let's face it. Yeah, with all those abs and whatnot. And that feathered hair that crazy mullet he has it's majestic his haircut fucking rules it's yeah wild. it was the first thing i noticed about him which is saying something because of those abs <laughs> next up uh we've got a character i really enjoyed even though he didn't he wasn't in the movie a ton we have kano a roughneck underworld crime lord with a cybernetic eye played by trevor goddard kind of the foil for sonya blade in the movie also i mean look if somebody's gonna fucking assert themselves in this rogues gallery it's goro a four-armed behemoth, the reigning champion of the Mortal Kombat tournament. I would say who he's played by, but it's kind of a team effort. You got special effects coordinator Tom Woodruff, who's wearing the 125-pound animatronic body, uh, and the head and the body and arms are controlled remotely by a team of uh, six puppeteers. And he was voiced, uh, Small World, by Kevin Michael Richardson, who we most recently know as playing Kamek. In the 2023 Mario movie. Oh, that's him. Okay. The Goro animatronic or just whatever. Well, all of this stuff was a real highlight of the movie for me. Oh, yeah. Um, another consistency with all these adaptations, I feel like, is like each one of them has given us like some weird like creature guy to kind of spend part of the movie gawking at, you know? Goro is a great addition to our roster of Toad, a Bobo, and, you know, to a lesser extent, Blanca. Blanca being kind of the, the weakest link of that. Yeah. My favorite piece of Goro trivia that I was able to track down was that the animatronic frequently broke down while they were filming, uh, and the person operating Goro from inside could only do so for two minutes at a time due to lack of oxygen in there. Oh, would have been an amazing way to die, though. Yeah, I guess this so. Guy suffocated inside <laughs> of Goro. Would you rather live or have four arms? He died doing what he loved, being inside of Gordo. <laughs> Gordo. Gordo. <laughs> I like the idea of a Canadian Goro who's named Gordo. Sure. I'm going to win the Mortal Kombat, eh? (laughs) And uh, Princess Katana, the Outworld Emperor, his daughter who fights for Shang Tsung, or does she? Played by Talisa Soto, who was a Bond girl in License to Kill. And uh, then finally we've got, uh, uh, we should just mention, you know, while we're talking about the bad guys, Scorpion, Sub-Zero, and Reptile. (laughs) They're all just played by some guys, though. Yeah, uh, except for it's worth mentioning that, that Scorpion's voice lines, of which there are like five, get over here, uh, come here, get down here. <laughs> I, <laughs> I like I like when they, <laughs> I loved when they got transported to that sca- like, scaffolding hell dimension. Yeah, he Scorpion's just goes, like hell, hell world. <laughs> yeah, he just goes, welcome, and then they keep fighting. <laughs> but that, those lines are, are delivered by Ed Boon series, Mortal Kombat uh, series co-creator Ed Boon. So, I mean, you know. Yeah. Can we, before we move on from Scorpion's hell scaffolding dimension, so he warps Johnny Cage into that dimension while they're fighting one another. And then 
uh, Johnny Cage beats him. He drops the autograph <laughs> photo of himself, which I think is like one of his victory animations or something. Okay. And then he walks away. How did he leave the hell dimension and get back to the island? Did it was there another portal for him to jump through? I don't know. Very strange. I assumed I assumed the hell dimension was just another part of the island. Okay. But you know, that is a good that is a good question. Crawl out of a couple of tunnels and you'll be back in the island, maybe. Maybe as soon as Scorpion dies, like the, that dimension like wilts, you know, it doesn't really exist anymore. And you go back through the <laughs> iMovie effect, the iMovie ripple effect, and end up in the forest again. Yeah. Uh let's talk about the critical reception of this film. On Rotten Tomatoes, it has a 47% critic score, a 57% user score, both of those categories the highest we have seen on the show so far. Right. And uh, Gene Siskel of the Chicago Tribune said that this was the only decent video game turned into a movie. Why? Obviously because the filmmakers have really tried to offer some eye-popping visuals that can provide the same stimuli as the video game itself. I'm a little disappointed that you didn't choose another quote that had like that had a shameless feature of some kind of like retro video game imagery in it. You couldn't find anything that mentioned joysticks or I know, but when Gene Siskel's weighing in, you gotta give him the floor. I watched this clip of him and Ebert. It was so funny. He was like yeah. really trying to browbeat Ebert into flipping it over to a thumbs up. He was really stumping. He's for like, it. you need to admit right now that you enjoyed this more than you expected to. <laughs> admit it right now. <laughs> And then I love this little thing at the end, like, I've never been interested in playing Mortal Kombat, but after seeing this film, I am. Yeah, I'm going to give it a try. I really will. <laughs> um, we also have, you know, a review from a Rotten Tomatoes user, in this case, Emo Clickbait, who says, It is sad to admit that this is one of the best video game movies because it is still fairly bad. You know, we're not in our ratings yet, but is Mortal Kombat a bad movie? I kind of feel like, separate to my own enjoyment of Mortal Kombat as a viewer, it's hard for me to come down on this too hard because it really feels like, how could I have expected a 1995 Mortal Kombat movie to do anything more than this movie does? Right. Sure, yeah. Let's step lateral to that. We've talked about this a little bit, but Trevor, have you had any experience personally with Mortal Kombat in the intervening years? Have you ever touched a Mortal Kombat game? No, I, I've never like really spent any decent amount of time with a Mortal Kombat game at all in my entire life. Like, it's not even like with Street Fighter. I've tried to make little inroads and I've like picked up new Street Fighter games as they've come out, but I've never really been drawn to Mortal Kombat the same way. I definitely had a moment with Eleven, the one that came out a few years ago, because it was like really kind to like having things in there to teach you how to be less bad at it. Uh -huh. And I definitely played it, you know, here and there at like on Genesis against my cousins, or I would, you know, pump one credit into an arcade machine uh, and then get frustrated very quickly and move on. What about you, Frankie? Are you Were you like a legit... Mortal Kombat player uh, in as a child, or is that like a later in life thing for you? No, as a, as a kid, yeah, I, I must have been seven or eight, and I had the first one for Sega CD, which you know restored some of that arcade sound. Damn, yeah, you know that famous promo that for like Mortal Kombat Monday or whatever the fuck it was. It was, it was whatever day it came to all the consoles. They they put out a commercial. Oh it was God, like, like that's right with the kid in the street, right? Yeah, like roaming gangs of kids that were are sort of like involuntarily yeah. called to violence. Mortal Kombat, yeah. saying it like Mortal it's the fucking Kombat. the Warriors or something. Yeah. So so wait, the Mortal Kombat commercial featured street fighting. <laughs> that seems really confusing. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, it more just featured like. Gangs of kids who were excited to play Mortal Kombat. I yeah, think. they actually, they, there's no fighting in this commercial. It's just, yeah, like troubled youths in street clothes, like marching in unison with like a shared cause. And then, you know, then they show gameplay footage. Did you have a main? Did you have a main uh, for Genesis Mortal Kombat or Sega CD Mortal Kombat? Uh, yeah, I guess Sub Zero I went to pretty pretty frequently um, because downright A for the freeze effect was really easy. And then, he ended up being in the third one, and th they did variations of that same uh, move, and you could spam it pretty easily. I remember I had Mortal Kombat 3, not Ultimate. I ended up getting Ultimate Mortal Kombat 3 later. That was kind of like the first ever, or, you know, early DLC, basically. Right. Where they released a whole nother 
uh, sixty dollar game just to add a few levels and a few characters. But yeah, but you're a kid. You don't got sixty dollars of disposable income. You're you're stuck between birthdays and Christmases, man. Yeah, yeah. You're waiting for a Christmas. That's that's exactly right. And I I, I remember I I I I was hell bent on finishing it on the hardest possible difficulty. Jesus. With the most number of levels. Yeah, and I did it uh, as a kid. I could never today. I, I you know famously on my podcast I sit in front of a Mortal Kombat two arcade one up every time. And whenever I try to play just like some straight Mortal Kombat 2, they give you like two or three wins and then they give you no more wins after that. Like you have to basically cheat at the game because it reads all your input. Single digit age hard moding Mortal Kombat 3 is like wild to me to think. Yeah. Well, you know, there's not a lot to do (laughs) at age seven. (laughs) (laughs) It's true. Yeah, and you and you have like you have like that special kind of kid patience at that stage in your life too that really turns video games in a whole different experience when it comes to difficulty. Some kids do. Other kids, you go over to their house and then have like a busted Genesis controller yeah. that they fucking bit it or <laughs> something. I barely remember this. So it's, it's almost hard to attest to it. As a big Mortal Kombat fan, I belonged to some kind of forum where we were writing our own Mortal Kombat fan fiction and characters. Oh my God. Cool. Were you in character posting? Were you RPing? Yeah, and we were getting super pissed at each other and... Oh man. Raiden has logged on. (laughs) (laughs) Did you post as an AU? Did you post as your own like OC? Yeah, I don't remember what the guy's name was. He was a Lin Kuei. I think he was dark purple. Power Rangers it up with the fucking ninja palette swaps. Would you guys come up like with your own like fatalities and stuff like that? Like So like my fatality is that like I punch through your chest and I rip at you or whatever. I, I wish I could remember. I mean, the, the, this was stuff that was hosted on like angelfire.com. And I mean, this is going like, this is some old man shit we're talking about. So I barely remember it. Yeah. God, imagine if there's some of that in the Wayback Machine and you could find it. Wouldn't that be, oh, be brilliant? Great. It'd be so good. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some interesting production details. There's a couple in particular this, this week that I really tickle me. I guess I'll start us off. So New Line was distributing and producing the picture. They wanted to use Virgin Records to make the soundtrack. And there is an early cut of this movie uh, that features like really heavy licensed music from Virgin artists like Janet Jackson and Van Halen. But I guess producer Lawrence Kasanoff, who has a very rich history with Mortal Kombat adaptations, we'll talk about him in probably future episodes, really hated that cut and felt strongly that techno music would serve the film's tone and its action a lot better. So he told New Line that he could cut a million dollars off of Mortal Kombat's budget if they would ditch Virgin Records and let TVT Records, a small independent dance music label from New York, uh, do the soundtrack instead. And then the CD release of that soundtrack went on to be like a big surprise commercial hit and... Uh, Mortal Kombat original motion picture soundtrack has the distinction of being the very first platinum selling EDM album in history. I think before the movie came out, they published a a cassette tape that I owned that was like Mortal Kombat songs. (laughs) And it was not related to the game in any way, except for uh, there was a song per character on the roster. So like if you looked at the song list, there was Johnny Cage, Sonya Blade, um, Shang Tsung, Raiden, Liu Kang, and they all were just like, um, yeah, like techno or dance. I remember the one that I remember in particular, it, it was a song called Prepare Yourself. <laughs> it was Johnny Cage's song. It was like, Prepare Yourself, Paren, Paren Johnny Cage. Yeah. And it was like, Prepare yourself, yourself, Mortal Kombat all the way, Prepare Yourself. Mortal Kombat here to say, oh, Johnny Cage is not afraid to die. Johnny Cage is not afraid to die. <laughs> this was like his real American Hulk Hogan song. Yeah, Johnny Cage is not Johnny Cage is not afraid to die. You know, the point is that there there was kind of all these this like chaotic merchandising around this brand when it popped, you know, it was a mo- This was clearly was striking while the iron was hot. And it, the mortal Kombat moment was a huge moment. Obviously. Yeah. This might be my favorite piece of trivia on the show so far, Trevor. Okay. Uh, during the fight between Liu Kang and reptile, you can very briefly in one shot, see a row of six orange medallions on the wall. And each medallion has a different symbol on it. Uh, question mark Goro Mortal Kombat and then that again question mark Goro Mortal Kombat logo like the dragon logo 
This is a combat code, spelled with K's, for the arcade version of Mortal Kombat 3, uh, the release of which pretty much coincided with the movie. It was a little bit before. And if you entered it, it would randomly switch your player character every round. We've got a video game movie with a fucking cheat code in it. That's pretty neat that you would have to go see the movie to get the cheat code for the new version of the game that was coming out. Yeah. Love it. Um, I really like this next piece of trivia, too, because I feel this like... This is like a beautiful tale, in my opinion, a it, Hollywood tale. It, and it really dovetails nicely with some stuff we talked about on the last episode as well, I think. Um, in the original three games, Kano is depicted as Japanese-American, uh, but Mortal Kombat series creators Ed Boon and John Tobias were big fans of Trevor Goddard's performance in this movie, so they decided to change the character to be Australian for all subsequent entries of the game. Uh, and they did this because they mistakenly believed that Goddard was Australian, but in reality, he was a lifelong East Londoner and was doing a Cockney accent in the movie. <laughs> Easy to mix them up. Easy to mix them up. I didn't know that. Um, but surprisingly, Trevor Goddard enthusiastically embraced that that new typecast and claimed to be from Australia for the rest of his career <laughs> up until his death in 2003. <laughs> Uh, before which he played dozens of Australian villains across numerous TV shows and movies. I mean, that's a beautiful tale. Yeah, last week in Street Fighter, we had uh, an Australian actor uh, pretending to be British. Here we've got a British character playing a British character, so weird. getting mistaken for an Australian, and then choosing to kind of perpetuate that lie throughout the rest of their lives. He really made a meal of it, Trevor. He was a series regular on that TV show Jag, which I think grandmas watched because it had handsome men in nice uniforms. Yeah. And he was like a bad guy, you know, Australian commander who was always making things hard for the Jag boys. Uh, so, yeah, he really just, like fully converted to Australian because John Tobias and, and Ed Boon thought he was Australian. Rather than telling you everything that happens in the movie Mortal Kombat, filling your brain with information that you probably don't need, instead, Trevor and I like to do a tier list where we can grab any element of the film that we feel strongly about and put it into a tier. We take turns, we go F, D, C, B, A, S. And uh, I believe that I've got the F tier this week, Trevor. That's right. You're starting off by, you know, identifying what, for your money, is the worst thing about this movie. You know, I got I just got to put Reptile into the F tier. I got to put him in there. Aww. Get this fucking freak out of my face, Trevor. <laughs> the design here, hideous. He is a... He's a disgusting CGI, yeah. a twisted CGI phallus of barely textured polygons. He's animated in a jerky, weird way. His, like, perspective never seems to be right. He's, like, slipping in and out of the reality of the shot. I learned that, I guess, all of the reptile material in this movie were pickups and reshoots because I guess test audiences were like, the movie needs another fight. Mm -hmm. And that annoys me, too, because it feels like, Oh, okay, well, should we make another cool puppet like we did with uh, Goro? And they're like, nah, this CGI, that's the future. And so you got yeah. Paul W.S. Anderson just like shooting empty frames and saying, I guess they'll animate stuff in this. And that just seems like a harbinger of bad filmmaking to come to. So that that gives me yeah. a little bit even less goodwill for it. So yeah, I'm putting F uh, Reptile here in the F tier. He, he really didn't do anything for me. Yeah, I think this movie does have some actually pretty cool looking effects. But the CGI in many instances, it just is not there yet. And a lot of the portrayals of like depictions of Reptile... Like, those are some of the, like, most egregious examples, I think. I do like once he gets fully, like, you know, once he gets transmutated into his human form or however that works in the movie, um, and he has that ensuing fight with Liu Kang. I thought that's a pretty good fight scene. It's an okay fight scene. I mean, Liu Kang does a bicycle kick in it, which is cool. Yeah. But it also feels, like, pretty stakesless. Like, it does, it just kind of like, okay, here we are on our way to the third act confrontation. Oh, wait, Reptile, let's do another fight. Yeah. That's obviously because it was a reshoot. They, they didn't have a way to make it like an interesting, to give it story stakes. Everything you're saying is totally, totally sound from a story structure, <laughs> you know, what makes a good movie. Uh, but I'll say this again, as a, as a fan of the game, Reptile was the hidden character right. in the first game. Yeah. And so this notion that there's this kind of character in the backdrop, eavesdropping on scenes who eventually kind of culminates into a threat. And to ha I think to have a threat that, uh, Liu Kang has to overcome in Outworld makes some narrative sense because otherwise, what he's gonna gonna waltz like un 
you know, unthreatened all right up to Shang Tsung's castle there, you know? Good point. I, th- I thought it was halfway decent fan service. As far as the CG, you're totally right. This was the same, you know, the, uh, the Reptile CG and the Power Rangers Ninja Zords CG in the 1995 movie, same year, um, stick out in my mind as like, wow, that was... You know, like uh, these really, really like prepubescent attempts at CG. <laughs> very garish, very uh, unappealing to look at. <laughs> Do you want to talk about our uh, D tier? Yeah, you're you're in the D tier here. What's something in this movie that didn't work for you? Uh, so for the D tier, I've selected this movie's PG thirteen rating. Sure, I understand that by giving it an R rating, you would have been making it way more difficult for its core audience to actually go see it in theaters. Uh, but as much as this movie actually seems to like really care about being true to its source material. Like the lack of gore and blood, unfortunately, feel like a like a real betrayal of the true spirit of Mortal Kombat. If I if I really didn't want to pull any punches, and considering what movie we're talking about, maybe I shouldn't. I would say that just like how last week we had to specify that the Street Fighter movie was technically an adaptation of Street Fighter Two, uh, we should say the Mortal Kombat movie is technically an adaptation of the bloodless Nintendo port of Mortal Kombat. The SNES one, which everybody knows is unfortunately the inferior version. You have to think, like, this just misses the DVD boom. If this had come out five years later, you'd have gotten, like, the unrated cut on DVD, for sure. The director's cut of Mortal Kombat, full of blood and gore and all kinds of nasty shit, yeah. I'm going to do the C-tier next. I've become very compelled by the B and the C-tier, because I feel like those... I know this. ...where we draw those lines, but right there on the line between things that did and didn't work in the movie... Those are the battlegrounds, Trevor, for how we really feel about these movies, I feel like. Yeah. And I got to say, the thing I'm putting in the C tier, the thing that almost works for me and just doesn't quite, is the Christopher Lambert Ryden voice. Oh, man. I loved it. I really enjoyed it. It's like he's doing an Orson Welles impression, but it's like teetering back and forth. And like at any moment, it could fall forward and turn into a Peter Laurie impression, or like it could fall backwards and become Christian Bale's Batman. It's ultimately, it's a little bit more distracting to me than it is fun. There was something so musical about like the degree to which he got Scandinavian with it for me. It is interesting. He's French, right? Yeah, it's a French guy playing a Japanese character doing a Scandinavian accent. <laughs> Frankie, where do you fall on the on the the right in voice of Mortal Kombat? Very, very memorable. Uh, you have been chosen to defend the realm of Earth. Oh, that's great. Yeah. In a tournament called Mortal Kombat. I didn't know we were getting a patented Frankie Frayne impression on this episode. That's exciting. I mean, he was really memorable. And there, he has a, there's a little bit of shtick. Um, I don't know why they wrote this into the movie, but do you remember, uh, Raiden continuously will laugh and then quickly apologize for laughing? Oh, they'd be like, sorry. (laughs) Sorry. Very weird. I don't know what he's communicating with that bit. I think Johnny Cage gets like a punch in on Goro or something and it cuts to him going like, yeah. And then he accidentally elbows a guy next to him and he goes, sorry. Yeah. When Johnny Cage does his nut crusher, his, his patented special move from Mortal Kombat 1, the nut crusher. Like, it seems like Raiden is the biggest fan of that move. You know what? That's S tier. If I was on the fence on Raiden at all, seeing him react to that moment the way he did, like, totally won me over. Yeah, watching Johnny Cage do his, one of his patented moves, knocking Goro in in the nuts, which, you know, begs the question of, like, I didn't even know this this guy had a dick. Sure. I I assumed he had four. (laughs) And then... (laughs) <laughs> and then quickly cutting to Brayden being like, ha ha ha, sorry. <laughs> Everything about that little, those 30 seconds is kind of incredible. <laughs> that to me is cinema right there. <laughs> That's right. Um, I got the A tier this week, right? Or no, wait, you got the B tier this week, right? That's right, yeah. And like you said, these C and B tiers are so interesting. I feel like the B tier is where things like, you know, what belongs here are, are the things that kind of just push through to being good and maybe even just push through to being very important to the finished product that we have here. And I think this thing is very important because for the B tier, I selected none other than uh, Paul W.S. Anderson himself. Oh, putting putting the patron saint here, canonizing him, if you will. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, he may have only had one prior movie under his belt before this and no prior experience working with visual effects or anything, but I think he really managed to at least deliver, like, a pretty coherent vision. He pulls off all the action scenes really competently, I think, especially some of the more elaborate ones like the scorpion fight. And I uh, also really like that he encouraged the actors to ad lib on set. And I think he got like pretty 
like if not good performances out of people, at least like pretty fun ones. Yeah. I don't know, he just feels like a really steady hand guiding the wheel of this movie, and it really makes a big difference to have, like, somebody who feels like at least a competent director behind the wheel of one of these things. I think it's the difference between getting a movie like this and getting a movie like some of the ones we've talked about previously. I wonder, five Resident Evil movies deep into the show, if you'll regret having put Paul W.S. Anderson into the B tier. We'll see if he makes it onto the tier list for any of those other movies and where he falls, right? That's going to be pretty interesting. Um, I have the A tier this week. Yes. And it's my great honor to finally, for the first time in show history, put a piece of music, a song, cool. into the tier list. Nice. Uh, it is not uh, Techno Syndrome, the beloved Mortal Kombat theme. The song I'm putting in the tier list, which you're hearing underneath me right now, oh. is called Halcyon and On oh. and On. It's by a yes. British duo called Orbital. In the film, it starts playing after Liu Kang kills Xiao Sang right at the end and reunites with his brother's ghost. So it's kind of the victory music. Uh, I put the soundtrack on this week just to kind of get a feel for it. And uh, something you know about me, Trevor, is that I've been getting into physical fitness this year. I like to do cardio sure. uh, on my elliptical machine. And man, this song has been like a real, it's been there for me all week. It's a new go-to. Uh, you can hear this big beat now. We're in ambient trance world now. Uh, I'm digging this. We got we got breathy <laughs> female vocals we're weaving in. We got that Sonic the Hedgehog pulse bass. You know? Dude, this we comes the... on in the club. I'm like throwing fists. I'm turning yeah, right? people to giant ice sculptures. A little really like sentient of, mouth is well, coming out I, of my hands. It makes me feel like, it makes me reflect on all the things we've had to overcome in order to defend Earthrealm. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Like, remember when Art Lean died? That was terrible. <laughs> when this, when that song rolls in, uh, Liu Kang, you know, looks softly at his colleagues and he goes, let's go home. I do that all the time, like, to this day, like, uh, like if we're, you know, done at the supermarket or something, I'll, I'll yeah. be like, let's go home. <laughs> and then your, then your daughter, your seven-year-old daughter probably goes like, wow, my dad's so cool and I get all of his references. <laughs> no, she goes, dun, 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 <laughs> dun. But, um, but I try to add big trivia about that song. Um, that same song appears in the Angelina Jolie movie Hackers. Whoa! It, it's featured just as prominently, and like uh, uh, I remember, I, I looked it up a few years ago because I, I too wanted to listen to it. And they were like, uh, you know, uh, whatever the song title you just said was from Mortal Kombat plus Hackers. <laughs> it's like what it's attributed to. <laughs> Man, that's a that's an honorable credit to be in both of those silver screen classics. Yeah, yeah I just think it's like a really top tier '90s ambient trance song. Like, what a cool discovery to get from the Mortal. Combat OST I'm putting in the A tier. All right, so let's finally talk the S tier. What's the best thing about Mortal Kombat? What's what are you putting in the S tier? What do you love about this movie? Glad you asked, Dylan. For this one, for the S tier, I'm going to uh, slot in the resemblance this movie bears to its source material. Oh yeah. Like I have no doubt that real Mortal Kombat fans have their issue with this movie. We've already kind of touched on that briefly, but really, this movie has so much more of its source material's day, DNA in it than any of the other adaptations we've watched so far. Totally. And it really isn't like stingy and like doling it out for its audiences to enjoy. Like, uh, it opens with the iconic Mortal Kombat scream. That's, like, the first thing you hear. You barely have to wait 15 minutes before Scorpion and Sub-Zero show up on screen in, like, game-accurate outfits. Yep. They say fatality. They say flawless victory. The only thing that doesn't feel kosher to me uh, is Raiden, but I enjoyed that, you know, this version of him so much, I kind of gave it a pass. Everything else it does really does feel like it's done in service of bringing the video game to the big screen. So, you know, say what you want about the quality of it as a film but if nothing else this is like one mortal Kombat ass movie i think totally i feel like we needed one of these by now like at this point in the show like we really needed something that actually felt like it was hitting on what it was supposed to be after all the ones we've gotten through so far who knows how long until that happens again but hey we got one watching the techno syndrome song uh timed to the new line cinema animated logo is very iconic to me. Yeah, it's a great moment. 0. 0.00 seconds, somebody's screaming the words of Mortal Kombat <laughs> at you. Hey, man, that's that's what it was like. Whether it was the New Line Cinema logo or it was Roaming Gangs of Children, uh, that was this <laughs> franchise. <laughs> Let's do some scores here. We like to, we borrow the 90s Game Pro magazine scoring system. Frankie, were you a Game Pro reader in the 90s? Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't subscribe, but I remember... Um, every time we went to the pharmacy, if I was sick, 
Uh, one of like the little rewards I got, uh, you know, consolation Ooh, yeah. prize for being sick was a Game Pro magazine. Oh yeah, fucking Otter Pop, give me a Game Pro. Yeah. Uh, we we borrow their scoring system entirely, which is broken down in the category of graphics, sound, control, fun factor, and challenge, rated on a scale from one to five. Let's start with the graphics, Trevor. What are you giving Mortal Kombat? For its graphics. Uh, well, I think a lot of things in this movie looked pretty awesome. Like, the sets in particular are great. Like, one of my favorite scenes in the movie was the Kano and Goro scene, which is set in this, like, giant Temple of doom ass chamber filled with, like, a billion candles and a big table that is overflowing with, like, a huge feast of opulent food. So, like, the sets were a big one for me. And, I mean, like, this is a movie with Goro in it. So, like, I, I have to give it a high score. I'm going to give this one a uh, 4.0. Uh, I'm just going to, I do feel like I need to dock it one whole point just because the CGI wasn't really quite there yet. But in general, I'm pretty down with the way it looks. I'm mi- I'm more mixed on this than you are, I, I'm afraid yeah. to say. I think the temples and the tombs read a little cheap to me and like not the most, in a way that doesn't engender great affection for me as a person who does enjoy a schlocky, cheap soundstage stat. Uh, the costuming's really good. Goddamn, some of those exterior locations are truly gorgeous they shot this like yeah all over southeast asia and some islands and i mean there's some really beautiful uh settings here i think paul ws anderson could be accused of of composing some ugly shots in this movie um again hard for me to come down because it does look a lot and feel a lot like that game so i i can't go too hard on it and like you said goro is a real he's real movie magic so i'll come down yeah to a 3.0 on that one there are some like speaking of the way um uh anderson chooses to shoot some stuff there is some pretty creative framing in this movie my favorite instance of which is in that uh the first phase of the johnny cage uh scorpion fight scene where scorpion emerges from behind a tree that is like clearly too skinny to have been concealing his entire body (laughs) and they just kind of fake that (laughs) by not showing the entire tree in the shot I'm going to go full Cisco mode, though, here. You have to admit, you have to admit that this movie features, <laughs> like, even more depiction of, like, 2D profile shot fighting that is true to the gameplay than the Street Fighter movie did. You have to admit it! I, I'll cede that point to you. Frankie, give me a 1 to a 5 on this on the graphics of Mortal Kombat. Just go with your heart. Yeah, I think, like, like a 3.5, if I may. Split the difference. You know, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't say, like, like dead average I think it, it does have some creative vision to it. It, 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 it. I agree that some of the temples and some of the interior sets read a little bit um, cardboard, and the and a lot of the exteriors look good. I do think that 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 for instance, you know, even though the blocking is awkward, um, that forest is, sequence with Johnny Cage and Scorpion is actually quite striking. It's beautiful looking. It, yeah, it looks really cool. And yeah, I I, I think that this movie would have been better served. Um, to lean harder into their animatronics work because Goro, while schlocky, I think like is very memorable, uh, really striking. Um, the voice, of course, really works. So, yeah, maybe if they could have done like Reptile, for instance, or a few other things with uh, animatronics, that because they obviously had that working. If Reptile was a little puppet, I would have had a much better time overall. I feel like I read that they actually, unfortunately, had to like cut down on the amount of Goro in the movie just because the animatronic was so hard to work with. Like there was more Goro planned. I felt served by the amount of Goro. I felt like I had enough of him. Yeah. There's a wide shot of Goro. It's right after, I think it's right after Johnny Cage hits him. And he and Johnny Cage like runs away and, you know, baits him to go chase after him. And there's a really, really wide shot. And the Shang Tsung henchmen are all chanting Goro's name. And Goro kind of, he looks very top heavy. He shouldn't be seen in that wide shot. He looks <laughs> he looks off balance. It's like, when, he, it's like when Kermit the Frog is walking around. <laughs> Something's wrong here. It, Something's not working. It looks, like he's, it looks like he's bopping and dancing to the sound of his own chants. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of awesome. Uh, well, or just get Captain Lou Albano to wear an extra pair of arms and have him do the Goro, right? <laughs> Swing your arms from side, all four of them. <laughs> uh, I'll take the sound first here. I think the music overall is iconic. The mix is really good. There's great fully. I think something that really helps the like toned down level of violence is how much like bone crunching and spine cracking you get mm. here. Uh, yeah, there's some exteriors that have like pretty heavily 
very sibilant dialogue looping, but I feel like that's more of a feature than a bug when you're talking about a martial arts movie. And maybe four separate times is arguably too many times to play the song Techno Syndrome in one nah. movie. But nah. in the world of video game cinema, I would be shocked if anything clears this too high. Here comes a big boy score. I'm giving it a 5.0. Wow. Mm. That is, I think, the first five we've gotten on the show so far, is it? I think it earned it. Yeah. I also have nothing but good things to say about this score. I didn't go quite as uh, high as you did, but I do feel like, in addition to mentioning how good the score is, which we've already done at length, I, I also need to like, admit that how much I enjoyed Raiden's accent kind of factored into <laughs> my uh, sound score. <laughs> I went with a four on this one, which I think is a really good score. And it's cool to get Ed Boon in there. Get down here. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, like, the the production on Scorpion's vocals was also pretty fun, I think. Okay, Frankie, sound. What do you got for me? Yeah, I, th- I think four is totally fair. I mean, it, it, the, I mean that Techno Syndrome song, few things <laughs> work as well in this life as that Techno Syndrome song. Like, does anybody dislike that fucking thing? I mean, that it, it, it slaps, and it's been slapping since 1993. You can fill it up with game quotes it's great it's like it's like the bat dance but fully realized i mean i i actually do wonder like uh like uh, you know sometimes i'll go to road races and they'll they'll always play you know eye of the tiger or you know other like 80s hits techno syndrome could be like a jock jam it easily could i'm surprised it's not hit, hit me abruptly with mortal gaba and maybe giant projections of the new line cinema Listen, are you a are you a coach of a, or a manager of a let's say minor league hockey team? Get in touch. Let's <laughs> talk about weaving techno syndrome into the mix there. Yeah. All right, let's uh let's next talk about um control, which is a category we like to use to discuss how much uh this movie feels like a video game. Yeah, the video gaminess factor. Not necessarily how much it feels like Mortal Kombat or but just like does it feel like you're watching a video game come to life, you know? I think that just by virtue of being so true to its source material this is the most any of these adaptations have felt like a video game to me by far like not only do the fight sequences read as gameplay but the premise the characters and the settings all feel straight out of a video game uh so i'm gonna go all the way and give this one a five you know there's tons of fan service you've got lines of dialogue pulled from the games the costumes look good i do think this cgi while kind of garish is very video gamey oh yeah And I mean, half of Act 2 and all of Act 3 is essentially just fight after fight after fight. We run through the roster. uh, And something that has not yet happened for me in one of these movies is that when it was over, I wanted to play Mortal Kombat, which really should be the goal of these, right? Aren't these, in a sense, just long commercials? It has a fucking cheat code in it. Yeah, you got to go high. I will leave a .5 buffer there just imagining that maybe somewhere down the road somebody will be even more committed to the idea of what if movie was video game, and I'll give it a 4.5. Cool. Frankie? Yeah, I, I, I think a, a 4 or 5. I, I'll, I'll add, or I'll, I'll, I'll zig where you zagged. I think um, the, the movie feels very much like Mortal Kombat. More than it does a video game. I don't. Ne- I, I I hear everything you're saying. It's all sound, but um, I I think the game itself already was somewhat immersive with the the digitized characters and it you know at least at, the, at that time for the early '90s it was quite cinematic in its presentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it sparked the imagination, and then this kind of did the same thing, but in a way that only a movie could do. So they played off of each other really nicely. Um, and but when you say, "Hey, this," the, like I feel like I'm watching a video game. I don't know that I felt that way, but I often do with modern cinema. Like, I, you know, I, it often feels like uh, when stories are structured around MacGuffins or fetch quests um, or power levels. Rise of Skywalker might as well be a fucking uh, RPG. Yeah. So I feel like I see a lot more of that. Like, um, hey, we, like we don't even know how to tell a story anymore. That's not a video game now. <laughs> Than back then. Back then, yeah. it was like we know a little bit more about uh, we know a little bit more about movies than we do about video games. Right. That's why so many of the adaptations were were poor because they didn't even know how to service the thing in the first place. <clears throat> Somewhere in the in the disparate data points of our scores exist the objective truth. So take the averages here, and you'll probably find it. <laughs> That's right. Let's talk about the fun factor of this film. I'll be the bummer in the room and say that I did not have a ton of fun watching this movie. I definitely didn't laugh at anything. The Johnny Cage quips were pretty much all groaners for me. Goro did give me some joy, and I do think there's some competent martial arts action in here. 
I think when the fights have those narrative stakes, they are interesting fights. Like Sonya versus Kano is not like a, a two brilliant martial artists showing off their skill, but like the story has set up that conflict to the point that it feels like important and exciting. I am going to go down to a 2.5 though, because I did think, especially on a second viewing, I was, I was definitely in like, I don't need to watch this movie again, uh, territory when I watched Mortal Kombat, <laughs> Trevor. Okay. I went significantly higher than you. Um, I can't go all the way to a five on this just because it's like truly not the type of movie I would just put on to have fun in general. But I think if you're looking specifically for an example of what video game adaptations were like in these early days of the medium, I'm going to be like really surprised if we see something in the next, like say five years that I have a better time with than this. Uh, between the fight scenes, um, all of the quipping and like the cast playing off each other, the cool sets and like the wacky effects. I just thought there was a lot here to keep me entertained, and I was, so I'm going to give it a 4.5. A 4.5 fun factor. Yeah. Now Frankie Frayne to keep the alliteration going in this sentence that I'm saying. Uh, what was your <laughs> score for how fun it is to sit down and watch Mortal Kombat? Probably a harder thing to pin down for you, right? Because there's you'll never kind of be able to watch this movie as modern-day Frankie. You'll always be like living in the shadow of yourself as a child. Yeah, and if I'm honest, like, if if I were to watch it fresh, I'd be like, what is this piece of shit? But, um, uh, in the reality that I live in, it's like a 5.5. I think it's, Sick. like, the thing it has going for it is how fun it is. Uh, and, I, and, and I think I can stand behind that um, with, like, some degree of objectivity. I think that the, the Christopher Lambert, you know, comedy choice there is just plain fun. I, of course, think that uh, uh, animatronics and prosthetics are fun. I think um, some of the deaths, Sub-Zero's fatality where he, he freezes, and th th that was another way they could get away with some brutal violence was to explode somebody who was frozen. Breaking a ninja into a bunch of chunks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think that, like, the call to, uh, call to adventure element actually works pretty well here where it, it's three fish out of water. Uh, I mean, less so Liu Kang, but Liu Kang, Johnny Cage, Sonya Blade... Uh, grouped together against their will, find themselves on a boat uh, heading towards their destiny. It's it, it's got a little bit of Indiana Jones. It's got a little bit of like you know you're all gonna have to uh, uh, work together to figure this out. Did you know that the world rests in your hands? Right. I actually think that stuff kind of works in this movie. Not to mention, since you're bringing it up, the fact that that conversation where Raiden is explaining to the main three like the rules and what's going on here. That happened 17 minutes into this movie. That's how economical we used to be with our storytelling, that we could introduce yeah. three protagonists, a bad guy, and like a mentor figure, and be telling you what Mortal Kombat was 17 minutes into a movie. God, the lost art form of the economical first act. I wish that we could bring them back. Yeah. Mm. We need to return. That'd be a good thing to graph out. Okay, one last category, challenge. How hard is it to sit through Mortal Kombat? Again, I think that that brief first act is a lot of help. That's where I often lose films is during the expository section. There's a lot of fights in here. Sometimes they're fun. Sometimes they're filler. I don't love the th main three. There's too much bickering between those main three. They spend a lot of this movie just like... <laughs> they're just like fucking taking slides at each other. Uh, that's a little grating for me. I, but you know what? It's not like a big bummer to get through. It's an hour and 40 minutes. I'm going to put this at, we don't do one through five because of the challenge, the way that uh, game pro has it. We do uh, beginner, intermediate, advanced expert. And I suppose theoretically we could also say adjustable, but I don't exactly know what that means yet. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait till we finally have an adjustable movie. So far it has not yet happened. We'll see if there's some kind of a choose your own difficulty feature in one of these movies, but I'm going to give this a beginner, but I'm going to, I'm going to note that it's a high beginner. It's not like I'm having the best time here. Okay. Um, I'm also going to go beginner. Uh, this was the first of the movies we've covered that I actually sat down and watched front to back twice. Oh yeah. And while there are a few moments where my attention wavered both times, I really was not struggling even by the end of that second watch. Um, I think it'll definitely help you if you're already a little inclined towards cheesy nineties adventure flicks. But I really can't imagine this movie significantly trying the patience of anyone, save for, like, the snobbiest viewers. Uh, i love to hear it. Frankie, is there any challenge when you sit down to watch? Do you own this movie on Optical Media? I've been meaning to ask. Yeah, I, I, I think I have it on Blu-ray, but I certainly have it on DVD. Yeah. Okay. 
uh, this would be perfect for that that little CRT legacy setup I've got upstairs. Oh, it would be cool if you still had that original dubbed VHS. Yeah, it would be really cute. That little Frankie handwriting on the side of it. Um, uh, and imagine you have it sitting on a shelf right next to a, an 8-inch floppy that has the backups of your forum posts about your OC, <laughs> just like in its own little glass container. And perhaps, perhaps uh, a backup or two of the MP3s from that cassette tape. <laughs> <laughs> about Johnny Cage isn't afraid to die. Your Mortal Kombat corner with a K. <laughs> Johnny Cage not afraid to die <laughs> um the runtime of this thing is an hour 35 so it's brisk yeah and i would say you know if, if i'm fair there is a, a section of the movie that i like post goro dying and then like trudging throughout world and getting to the final battle and there is kind of a i i assume like a 15 to 20 minute or it feels that way anyway that's like the one segment of the of the movie where like i probably would um go to the bathroom never to return so we've we've only got two little mini sections left that we like to do here at the uh, end of the show. The first one, Dylan, you're trying to like revisit all these games that we're going to be covering and at least play a little bit of them. Did you manage to sit down and play some of the original Mortal Kombat before the show? I hear it was kind of difficult this time. I did, and that's the first thing I want to talk about. So I wanted to play Arcade Mortal Kombat 1. I found out that fucking, since WB bought Midway, you can't play it legit anymore. It's not for sale on any modern storefronts. So I went the piracy route, but I mean, come on, guys. Digital preservation, these are some of the most important games of the 1990s. I know it's WB, and they don't give a shit about their uh, back catalog or... You, you could even argue that they actively hate you, the consumer, but that was a little bit upsetting to me. I did get it working on my Steam Deck. I played Mortal Kombat 1. I went with Johnny Cage. I learned his moves. I can get up through the mirror match with the uh, with another Johnny Cage, but once you get into the fucking endurance battles where you got to fight two guys, I'm toast. I can't get past it. I'm not good enough. But I do think that those games are they're still fun to be had with arcade Mortal Kombat. It's a got it's a pretty simple layout, block button, you know, high kick, low kick, high punch, low punch, a couple of special moves. It's not too technical. I had a pretty good time. Frankie, do you have you played Mortal Kombat original recently? Yeah, I mean I've got it on this arcade, of course. And um yeah, I'll give it a I'll give it a, a whirl every once in a while. It, it, I you know, the conventional wisdom is that the first one is only okay. And that the, by the second one, they really had a great arcade game there. And then a lot of people feel like there was a dip in quality after that. Well, the feeling is maybe three goes a little too far in some places, to quote George Lucas in the best behind-the-scenes <laughs> uh, documentary ever. Might have gone too far in a few places. <laughs> um, yeah, I I think uh, the only problem with, with Mortal Kombat 2, though, is it's really fucking hard. Like, yeah. just, like, unreasonably hard. Mortal Kombat, still cool. I had a better time with it than I was expecting to, Trevor. Cool. Well, this brings us to our final segment, one of my favorites. Oh, yeah. Um, which I think now we're calling, um, if this wasn't a movie, if it wasn't a video game before it was a movie, and then it became a video game after it was a movie, what kind of video game? It would be. That's word for word the name of the, the segment, including that false start. Yeah, I didn't stutter earlier. That's part of the title. Um, <laughs> and, you know, I feel like astute listeners may have caught on to the gimmick of this segment by now, where, like, the game that we decide this movie would be, if it wasn't a game already, it's not always going to be the same kind of game that it was in the real world where it was a game first. Right. Uh, I got to say, this was the first instance where I have been rethinking that approach and maybe kind of having to concede that uh, Paul W.S. Anderson made a movie that is so unmistakably based on a fighting game that this could only ever be a fighting game. So maybe you're just going to reverse engineer Mortal Kombat from the Mortal Kombat movie then. Maybe that would happen, but just stick with me here. Doesn't this story, doesn't this movie also have all the trappings of a great like Super Nintendo era uh, top-down, like, JRPG. Hmm. You got party. You got a three-person party. You got you got a classic party. You got a classic, like, JRPG-esque mentor figure in Raiden, who you know is going to, like, join the party in an uncontrollable fashion at some point and be, like, level 999 or whatever and have, like, a billion HP. He's going to open his, like, spell list, and you're going to be like, whoa, look at all the spells that Raiden has. But you can't cast any of them, of course. Yeah. The only, you know, uninteresting facet of it, I think, would be the fact that everybody in your party is, like, a monk or 
or whatever the you know fighting classes in those games but yeah. other than that i think like this would be you could really give this thing like the earthbound treatment you know and i have to imagine that if this were the case you'd only be able to play it in japan it would have like a long history of almost coming stateside, but just never quite making it there. There's a really bad fan translation that nobody thinks is good. Yeah. And even to this day, Nintendo would still be like, you know, teasing the Switch release, but it just wouldn't, you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't get Mortal Kombat RPG on the Switch. Frankie, if Mortal Kombat, the movie, the RPG exists, would it finally compel you to play through a JRPG? Oh, God, no. <laughs> 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 we're, we're taking turns doing fatalities at each other. Well, you know, you would build up your limit break bar, and then you could do your fatality, obviously. What if you found out that Art Lean had, was, like, secretly recruitable? <laughs> oh, like, and I, and I could be bereft when he dies? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> oh, dude, the Art Lean death in Mortal Kombat RPG would be the Aerith death of that generation. <laughs> oh, yeah, when Sephiroth yeah. stabs Aerith, it would totally be one for one, yeah. I hear you can resurrect Art Lean, but what you have to do uh -huh. is you instead of punching Goro in the nuts, <laughs> it's like it's total <laughs> bullshit too. Like it, <laughs> you can't actually unlock Art Lean. I also want to know, Trevor, are you still unsullied when it comes to the roadmap? Do you still is the future still a mystery to you as to what our next video game adaptation is going to be? I obviously know some things that are coming down the pipe at some point. I know we've got some Tomb Raiders to do. I know obviously we've got the Paul W. S. Anderson Resident Evils coming but like the immediate future is still very hazy for me well you might have felt by now having done in a row now double dragon street fighter and mortal Kombat, that you're kind of over the whole fighting game beat em up thing maybe your your hunger is finally sated i'm feeling fatigued my stamina bar is low i'm delighted to tell you that we do have a palate cleanser coming up next week in fact we get to skip an entire year there were no video game movies in 1996 trevor Okay, so I guess after this one was not well received, they were like, we got to take a step back, figure out what's going on here, maybe come back and eat. We got to go away and dream it all up again. And we'll see what was dreamed up next week <laughs> when we watch 1997's Mortal Kombat Annihilation. <laughs> Right, I did read that this was a thing that happened. Oh yeah, I didn't know that this was going to be the immediate next one. But all right, we're going we're going back to Outworld or Earthrealm or whatever. Hey, you're the you're Mortal Kombat's newest number one fan. You should be I guess stoked so. that we get to spend more time with all your bros. Yeah, at least I at least I assume they got the entire cast back for the sequel. Do you remember Frankie in this movie when Princess Katana has her very cryptic clue that she gives Liu Kang for his uh, fight against Sub Zero? to use the source of life. Yeah, and he's like, water. <laughs> like, wait, what? So I assume you've seen Mortal Kombat Annihilation. I sure have. Do, do you have any similar sort of cryptic piece of advice to impart to us before we challenge it next week? Um, what could possibly go wrong <laughs> after a movie as good as 1995? <laughs> what could, They can't possibly... Yeah, I, I look, um, I don't know. I don't know how to prepare you. It's the, the, the this one is you're gonna, you're gonna remember this one. <laughs> I mean, I feel like they figure they cracked the code, right? Just make another one, right? Yeah, get Paul W S Anderson back. Have either of you seen the movie? No. no. Okay. Wow. Holy fuck. Um. So, <laughs> uh, uh, all I can say, I mean, it, it, it's an infamous film. I don't want to ruin anything else. <laughs> all I will tell you is, you're gonna be howling in the first five minutes. Okay. Okay. All right. And not just because I want to touch Veronica Von Tiny, I'm going to be howling for some other reason. Yeah. You're unfortunately, um, Veronica Von Tiny is not in this movie. Who oh, no. Um, uh, yeah. And, and I, I hope you didn't like Christopher Lambert too much. <laughs> oh no. All right. Well, Hey, thank you for these cryptic clues, uh, which I am spelling with K's in both mm -hmm. examples. <laughs> nice. I like it. Frankie. Thank you so much for coming on our little fledgling, uh, operation. It was an absolute joy to have you. Yeah. Yeah, well, thanks for having me. It was, I actually loved talking about this movie. And um, yeah, good luck on the next one, really. <laughs> good fucking luck. <laughs> but for Box Office the Bombs, I have been Dylan Flynn. I've been Trevor Ickrath. Frankie Fran. And until next time, so long, Gay Bowser. <laughs>
This has been a production of The Lighthouse Keepers Company. Culture illuminated. <laughs>